All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Scott Pierce, yes, Executive Director day. of the Premium Cigar Association. I'm with Joshua Haberski, Head of our Government Affairs, and Greg Zimmerman, our mighty fearless leader, President of the Premium Cigar Association. We're coming to you today to talk a little bit about some federal updates, uh, which we thought was going to be a more important update. We still have some things to discuss. Uh, some stuff is coming down the pike in terms of this tax bill, the Build Back Better plan, and uh, also some interesting things kind of happen. And we'll dive deeper into some of these things as more information comes out, as well as there were some key elections that happened last night um, that actually could have some importance and will have some importance as it relates to next year, whether it comes to Virginia, potentially Ohio. Uh, New Jersey is still too close to call it from what I understand. But we're going to dive into a lot of what this kind of means, particularly as it might play out on a federal landscape with some of these elections. Um, these other we get, well, Glenn will come on with this, this some state affairs here uh, next week or two. So on that note, let's have Josh Matt dive in a little bit about what's going on with this federal bill. Um, we know that obviously we've got some really good news that the tobacco uh, was uh, taken out of it completely. Uh, however, um, that's just the current state of play right now. Where is this bill? Is there a potential for this tobacco tax to rear its head at some point with this federal tax bill or this this big infrastructure plan that's going on? Um, and where does that sit right now? And yeah. what's sort of the prognostication of what we're anticipating over the next you know days and weeks? Absolutely. And Glenn and I did a, a state update, state forecast last, last week that we went over a lot of the intricacies of where things stand. And, you know, some things have shifted since that update. Uh, but as you correctly pointed out, in the last iteration of legislative text that was released on October 28th, the tobacco tax equity provisions were not included in the Build Back Better Act. Um, however, you know, these are ongoing, very active negotiations in both the House and the Senate. Um, today, you know, I think with the flurry of the election results, um, and as well as some of the different things that were reintroduced into the Build Back Better Act or the intention of including these right. with the paid medical leave, uh, family medical leave. Uh, there's a lot of this discussion about the SALT deduction, which is the state and local taxes right. being included. Those are pretty contentious. And, and you have senators, moderate Democratic senators that have posed those things that were just re uh, you right. know, re-included, so to speak. Um, but right now, this really lies with the Rules Committee and the Budget Committee, as well as House and Senate leadership. So whether things are actually going to be included, um, it remains to be seen. A lot of active negotiations. There were a lot more active negotiations between the House and Senate, um, with what you really call pre-conferencing of a bill. Um, but our you know, in a $1.75 trillion package, the tobacco tax equity provisions weren't included. As new things are added and that price tag goes up, that's more of a concern for us in the industry because we were a designated pay for in the original $3.5 trillion. So not out of the woods completely. Yeah, because if they come back and I know that that one of the main issues that they've been talking about is this paid family leave act, right? Or, and, and wanting to bring that back. So if something like that gets a lot of pressure, which is starting to get right now, we could be back on the table or on the menu, I guess you should say, yeah. to try to pay for it. There's a host of pay for the energy industry, as well as you know the tobacco industry. That was included in the original renditions of this bill. Um, you know, they're, they're also looking at some ways of IRS enforcement as other paid fors but um, you know the projections that I've seen on the the paid and family medical leave is about 250 billion dollars. Um, so you know, again, as the numbers rise, that's more of a concern for us. Right. Um, that's why we've never taken our, our foot off the brake in terms of our advocacy. We've had a dozen meetings this week with moderate Democrats, uh, moderate Republicans about the issues that we're facing as the premium cigar sector, a small business sector. And it's important for folks that have not taken action and have not posted it on their uh, business social media channels, had it at the register uh, to go to cigaraction.org and, and relay the message. We updated the letter. Um, we are grateful that it was taken out of the latest rendition and we acknowledge that, um, which is important. And I think a, a, a key talking point that we need to emphasize 
uh, across the board is that this was not something that was part of the president's agenda. Right. He has twice, uh, his press secretary has twice backed away from the tobacco tax equity provisions. And also in the framework released by the White House, that was not included in it. So let me ask you your thoughts on this. And Greg, I'd, I'd be really interested to get your thoughts on this as well. You know, you've been a very active in state lobbying and, and understand how, you know, things can flow both ways when it comes to legislation, but things tend to trickle from the states on up, both good and bad. So last night we saw Virginia go red, you know, for governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general. My question there is, what do we think is going to potentially, does that signal something, do we think, at the federal level for Democrats in terms of this, in terms of, uh, again, going more moderate in this instance, and potentially taking a look at that, especially something like a tobacco tax, it's not on Biden's plan, but does that have a potential trickle out effect with other Democrats and their approach to this as we're going now into a midterm season? Well, I'll put my uh, my uh, limited uh, legislative lobbying experience here uh, to test. But I personally, what I what I saw last night in Virginia, uh, you have the first time in 12 years that a uh, Republican has won a statewide election in Virginia. Last night they won three. Right. Um, you you, you see how close it is in New Jersey. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, House of Delegates in Virginia flipped as well, so now they're all Republican. Um, so I think with that, and again, this is just a Monday morning quarterbacking, but to me, what it means is it's sending a message to probably moderate Democrats out there that saying, hey, guys, you, you need to, to step away from some of the more radical ideas out there and and take a more conservative approach. So I think that'll trickle through. I think, you know, and again, this is just after the uh, last presidential election, I think, and the one before, I think, you know, all the norms are kind of thrown out and, and it's hard to predict some of this stuff. But I think 2022 is going to probably continue uh, this so-called red wave or Republican wave. Uh, and I think that uh, trying to propose any new radical taxes in a uh, in that midterm election cycle, I think, will be very difficult, uh, especially for a lot of the moderate uh, Democrats that are running for either the House or Senate. Um, so I I'm hoping uh, and what I, what I think I'm saying is that uh, we're going to be okay here for a little while. Then after 2022, then if, if the Republicans do take uh, the House back, uh, I think it's what, a three-seat margin, right, Josh? Four-seat margin? Yeah. So it's a very small margin. Uh, it only takes one, one in the Senate to get back to uh, control of McConnell. And then I think you're going to see uh, you know, that we might be okay. But th that's on a federal level. Uh, like you just said earlier, a lot of this stuff percolates from the state. So that's where we're really, it doesn't matter really what happens at the federal level. Uh, we have to be vigilant at the very small municipal city, county, state level, and, and be very vigilant on some of these smoking bans, tax increases. A lot of these place states have given the, the uh, lo localities the, uh, the ability to tax and regulate all OTP. So, um, Josh would know much more about that than I, but uh, that's I think where we need to, to where we need to put our primary focus. I think federally we're we're looking pretty good, in, in my opinion. But uh, uh, we're not out of the woods with this taxing that could rear, rear its ugly head. But uh, hopefully, uh, with with the, the message the American people sent last night, I think uh, the uh, infrastructure infrastructure package that uh, was being proposed and it kept getting reduced, I think is. Uh, they sent a pretty clear message. We, you know, we had enough. Yeah, you know, I think with the tax increases that affect a lot of people, which you know, a tobacco tax equity would affect, yeah. uh, you know, millions of consumers. Yeah, um, that that is something that would it it, it definitely comes up at, in in the discussion from last night. Um, that there there were some things that, especially in that first rendition of the bill that were introduced that were radical, that were unpopular. There are pieces yeah. in there that are popular. Um, you know, I think the the consequences of the election remain to be seen. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would agree with you that the, it's trending uh, red. Uh, however, you know, 
immediately after the results of the election, and obviously we're still waiting in New Jersey for the, the outcome, you did have the reintroduction of other provisions that are more progressive. So I think that you're seeing a little bit of the blame game. The yeah. progressives are blaming the moderates. The moderates are blaming the progressives. And that's why we don't have definitive. I mean, if you look at the past two weeks, we've supposed to get we were supposed to get more legislative tax. The actual bill, you're seeing a lot of members of Congress, moderates especially, saying, hey, slow down. We need 72 hours to read the bill. Um, we need some time to go through all the different provisions while others are saying, all right, it's coming up for a vote. I mean, it was supposed to be the deadlines have come and gone. And I think that confusion deadlines don't mean uh, anything to them. <laughs> that, that confusion doesn't help anybody, whether you're, you're a moderate Democrat or a progressive Democrat. Um, but, you know, we, we built a, a coalition of, of folks and, and have been in offices that we have never you know, met with before freshman offices, uh, moderates to progressives, and the, there are different levers to the arguments that we've been purporting uh, that are, are resonating with folks. I think the immigration element, um, that was something that we really launched with the policy summit. Right. That has caught on and it's causing certain congressional office, offices that aren't necessarily pro tobacco or pro premium cigar to say, well, we gotta we gotta worry about the ramifications of this and what could the effects be. So, uh, I think what we're really looking for in the next few weeks is what is the consensus going to be? What is going to be in in terms of the total price tag? Is that going to be what the House comes up with? Is that going to be palatable in the Senate? Um, procedurally, there'll be something called a manager's amendment, which streamlines the process, brings things together. And in that manager's amendment, our hope is that, you know, the tobacco tax equity will not be in there, much like the latest rendition of the bill. And that's kind of one of the important things to, to bring up. This is another reason why we've expanded our reach into other programs like the International Policy Summit for the mere fact that we are trying to explicate to multiple layers at the federal government all the various ways the premium cigar industry is impacted and has impact on economies, the supply chains, or supply webs that are out there, and what that could actually mean. So it's not just about a tobacco industry. There's there's workers, there's taxes, there's migration, there's a whole host of other issues. There's shipping, there's all kinds of things that go on up to and including local employment and local taxes and, and other local issues that come up from it. And it's an entire chain of events, dominoes that kind of goes on there. And that's why we're, we're including and in, in things, things like the summit and deepening our reach for those very reasons is because we have a lot to say, important things to say that they need to understand when it comes to this industry that they don't consider. All they ever consider is lighting a tobacco leaf on fire, and that is the beginning and the end for a lot of those folks. So as we're educating them on all of the ramifications that these policies will have on the industry, you know, oftentimes a message about a consumer having to pay $2 more for a cigar, they don't care. They would prefer you have to pay $200 more for a cigar. Yeah. When we start talking about workers losing jobs, losing access to health care, losing access to education, having to leave countries, having to separate families, because you're going to destroy the local economy there just because they don't like a product that starts to resonate with folks. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot of that take place. We've gotten great uh, ground support because we're all about local brick and mortar retail businesses, family owned businesses, uh, and that we're not big corporations. And that's actually a major, major thrust behind a lot of our messaging that is resonating significantly with lawmakers and policymakers. And I think it's important to note that you know, this, the introduction of these tobacco tax equity in this larger package was a little bit of a surprise to, yeah. you know, most of the industry that, you know, we were told for the longest time, it's not going to be included. It's not going to be included. We, we had our suspicions, but when it was in fact included, you know, this is a marker. This is something where we have to set a precedent and, and we have, the onus is on us to set the precedent that this can't be something that comes up and has traction year to year. We've been battling this for months. We need to focus on proactive yeah. legislation right. and, and reduce the regulatory burden on the industry and on brick and mortar small businesses and, and retailers. So we have to push back on this much harder so that this doesn't come back next Congress or the Congress after that so that, uh, you know, 
this gives them kind of uh, um, a way to, to push it forward in this Congress and build off of it. We need to stave it off right now. And that's why it's critical that we continue to push full throttle. Well, this is one of those things to where, uh, again, sports metaphors, I think, work uh, sometimes in this instance to where, um, you know, in, in hockey, you know, you get a penalty called on you and you can actually get a lot of momentum from killing off that, that power play and turning that into an offensive thrust for you. And that's what we're looking at right here. We're going to kill this off right now, and then we're going to go on the offensive and take this momentum. We've making it like a lot of headroads, as I just talked about. And then now we can use that momentum to now go on the offensive and say, look, not only do you not damage us, but there's other things that exist that really hurt us that we can change, simple ways we can change to help our industry, to help all these other issues that we've brought to light. So that's what we're looking forward to, to, to doing. Yeah, and, and, and it's important to note we're not going to stop. We want to make sure that all of our membership is educated on this issue, you know, if we had to um, use the crystal ball and, and predict, this will be a reoccurring bill. It came up in 2019. It came up obviously this year. Um, and so we wanna make sure that folks understand what's at stake. Um, we did re recently put together a magazine article on tobacco tax equity in our next issue. So I wanna, I wanna make sure that you know, folks are aware of that. There will be timely developments between now and when that magazine is at the, our members' doorsteps. But, um, you know, this is something that we need to be vigilant of for, for the foreseeable future. Also in that magazine, we'll have some state association contact info, as well as a state association forecast, which we talked about in the segment last week that Glenn and I did. Yeah. Gracie, Orlando, Wes, Mike, it's good to see you guys in Orlando. I hope everything goes well with your uh, transition to Florida. And absolutely, we're very excited about the new attorney general. Um, we do think that we're going to actually, uh, being a resident of Virginia, I'm, I'm pretty excited about what this can mean for some of the changes to take place in Virginia to, to help the local Virginia retailers. I know that that's going to be important. I think we're going to get some good stuff done in Virginia for that. So very much looking forward to that. Uh, Greg, any last thoughts before we uh, get everybody back to their Wednesdays? No, I just think it's, uh, you know, continue the uh, beating of the drum it's 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 extremely important for everyone uh more now than ever uh, to to get involved you, you see the fights that they're going to constantly come up uh you know all the way from local to the federal level and, and it's time now to if you're not in a state association form one it's not that difficult and um it's a very effective tool even uh i've, I've used our state association membership here uh, we have very bipartisan cigar caucus here and I've helped had those guys help me uh, at the federal level so uh, you know you can kind of build that relationship from the local on all the way up to the federal level and I think uh, it's a very effective tool so please just get involved and uh, any of the tools uh, that you need uh, we have them we have a toolbox and we can uh, we can help you put it together Absolutely, Greg. That's a good point. You know, with the state associations, you know, we were able to work with them to get 15 letters sent to key senators yeah. and House members like that. I think previously it was, you know, you had a lot of state advocacy and you focused. Every, everyone was focused on their individual state and the locality. PCA, we want to be a honest broker and partner to facilitate re relationships at the federal level coming from the states. You know, as professional staff, we, we can do only so much. We need to have the real small business owners, the people that have uh, a vested interest, that have employees, that have their livelihoods at stake, weigh in on these issues. And I'm really pleased even uh, tomorrow uh, in North Carolina doing a meeting with a state association leadership, uh, introductory meeting with a new freshman member of Congress, um, that's exactly the type of partnerships that's going to move the needle in, in getting some of these impressionable members to understand what a premium cigar is and is not. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, I, I don't know this to be a fact, but I, I would imagine that we have somebody in every congressional district in the country, if not close, yeah. close to it. And, um, and it, it, never see, it never ceases to amaze me how just one constituent coming in talking to a member about how something's going to affect their business in their in their um, district, 
how impactful that is. So don't think that your voice is not heard. It doesn't take a lot and it is so effective. Yeah. Uh, I've been I've been going to DC for 15 years and and I, I've seen like well, I walk into an office and, and I may not be the constituent of that person and and I, I get a sense or a feeling that you know hey the guy's gonna listen to me but he's not taking notes he's not really concerned but if I go into one of my PA reps and I mean they are they're all ears and they want to help you and they understand uh, how important jobs are in their state and uh, and don't ever think that your voice doesn't have some impact. Yeah. And we learned that in a very real way when we were, you know, a couple of years ago when we were at the FDA, when we started making some headroads in there in the last mm -hmm. administration, the message was very clear and direct to us from the Office of Stakeholder Relations. Your small business message is getting through and it's important to us and we want to work with you on that. So yeah. even at the top levels there, when they're looking at regulation for the industry, our small business message is coming through. So that's going to get even more pronounced and have even more weight, as you just said, when it's dealing with the local level. Again, they answer to you. So the more personal that touch is for you as a business owner, the more potent it is. Absolutely. Well, we have a half dozen additional federal meetings. Um, you know, between now and the end of the week, there's going to be timely updates that we'll provide through a variety of different communications channels. But we did want to um, talk briefly with everybody today about the current state of play and, and really emphasize that there is still a lot of work to be done. There, uh, you know, things are optimistic, uh, but we cannot rest on our laurels at all. Yeah, again, this is, this is uh, right now, uh, if I had to kind of wrap up the entire regulatory uh, personality as it relates to the premium cigar industry, it's really kind of pressing pause until they can try to figure us out, which means we've been very effective in a lot of ways, uh, but they're trying to figure us out. And so we can't let up. We can't deem this as a time to take any kind of naps or any kind of rest. It's a time for us now. Like I just said, we've got momentum. We know our message is starting to resonate at deeper levels. Now we need to go forward and be on the offensive now and start getting back positively and enact in our favor and and keep that going. Uh, and, and so that way, when they you know press the play button on us on again, we're going to be a lot more equipped to be able to fight back once they try to take that on again. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, Greg, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Yeah. And for those who are watching the recorded session, thanks so much again. I uh, hope everybody's having a great week as we're starting now to head into the holiday sales season. Uh, so please, again, reach out if anything comes up in your states, any questions, uh, federally, state, local, et cetera. We're always here. And also, uh, we are kicking off our now dues renewal season for all of those that are out there that are uh, members of the association. Um, start renewing now. Contact Aaron Holland if you have any issues with your membership renewals. So get that done as well and we'll head into a successful 2022 thank you greg thank you josh and thank you everybody for uh, tuning in we will see you all soon take care see you guys